Ruicus by James Russell Lowell from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator, Sonia as the dryad, and Jason in Panama as Ruicus. Ruicus. God sends his teachers unto every age, to every clime and every race of men, with revelations fitted to their growth and shape of mind nor gives the realm of truth into the selfish rule of one sole race therefore each form of worship that hath swayed the life of man and given it to grasp the master key of knowledge reverence enfolds some germs of goodness and of right else never had the eager soul which loathes the slothful down of pampered ignorance found in it even a moment's fitful rest hear now this fairy legend of old greece as full of freedom youth and beauty still as the immortal freshness of that grace carved for all ages on some attic frieze a youth named roicus wandering in the wood saw an old oak just trembling to its fall and feeling pity of so fair a tree he propped its grey trunk with admiring care and with a thoughtless footstep loitered on but as he turned he heard a voice behind that murmured rochus twas as if the leaves stirred by a passing breath had murmured it and while he paused bewildered yet again it murmured rochus softer than a breeze he started and beheld with dizzy eyes what seemed the substance of a happy dream stand there before him spreading a warm glow within the green glooms of the shadowy oak it seemed a woman's shape yet all too fair to be a woman and with eyes too meek for any that were wont to mate with gods all naked like a goddess stood she there and like a goddess all too beautiful to feel the guilt-born earthliness of shame rochus i am the dryad of this tree thus she began dropping her low-toned words serene and full and clear as drops of dew and with it i am doomed to live and die the rain and sunshine are my caterers nor have i other bliss than simple life now ask me what thou wilt that i can give and with a thankful heart it shall be thine then roachus with a flutter at the heart yet by the prompting of such beauty bold answered what is there that can satisfy the endless craving of the soul but love give me thy love or but the hope of that which must be evermore my spirit's goal after a little pause she said again but with a glimpse of sadness in her tone i give it roachus though a perilous gift an hour before the sunset meet me here and straight away there was nothing he could see but the green glooms beneath the shadowy oak and not a sound came to his straining ears but the low trickling rustle of the leaves and far away upon an emerald slope the falter of an idle shepherd's pipe now in those days of simpleness and faith men did not think that happy things were dreams because they overstepped the narrow bourne of likelihood but reverently deemed nothing too wondrous or too beautiful to be the guerdon of a daring heart so roicus made no doubt that he was blessed and all along and to the city's gate earth seemed to spring beneath him as he walked the clear broad sky looked bluer than its wont and he could scarce believe he had not wings such sunshine seemed to glitter through his veins instead of blood so light he felt and strange young roicus had a faithful heart enough but one that in the present dwelt too much and taking with blithe welcome whatsoe'er chance gave of joy was wholly bound in that like the contented peasant of a vale deemed it the world and never looked beyond so haply meeting in the afternoon some comrades who were playing at the dice he joined them and forgot all else beside the dice was rattling at the merriest 
and Roicus, who had met but sorry luck, just laughed in triumph at a happy throw, when through the room they hummed a yellow bee that buzzed about his ear with down-dropped legs, as if to light, and Roicus laughed and said, feeling how red and flushed he was with loss, By Venus, does he take me for a rose? And brushed him off with rough, impatient hand, but still the pea came back and thrice again. Roicus did beat him off with growing wrath. Then through the window flew the wounded bee, and Roicus tracking him with angry eyes, saw a sharp mountain peak of Thessaly against the red disk of the setting sun. And instantly the blood sank from his heart, as if its very walls had caved away. Without a word he turned, and rushing forth, ran madly through the city and the gate, and o'er the plain which now the wood's long shade by the low sun thrown forward broad and dim darkened well nigh unto the city's wall quite spent and out of breath he reached the tree and listening fearfully he heard once more the low voice murmur Rowicus. close at hand whereat he looked around him but could see naught but the deepening glooms beneath the oak then sighed the voice o oh, rochus never more shalt thou behold me or by day or night me who would fain have blessed thee with a love more ripe and bounteous than ever yet filled up with nectar any mortal heart but thou didst scorn my humble messenger and sends him back to me with bruised wings we spirits only show to gentle eyes we ever ask an undivided love and he who scorns the least of nature's works is thenceforth exiled and shut out from all farewell for thou canst never see me more then roicus beat his breast and groaned aloud and cried be pitiful forgive me yet this once and i shall never need it more alas the voice returned tis thou art blind not i unmerciful i can forgive but have no skill to heal thy spirit's eyes only the soul hath power over itself with that again they murmured nevermore and roicus after heard no other sound except the rattling of the oak's crisp leaves like the long surf upon a distant shore raking the sea-worn pebbles up and down the night had gathered round him o'er the plain the city sparkled with its thousand lights and sounds of revel fell upon his ear harshly and like a curse above the sky with all its bright sublimity of stars deepened and on his forehead smote the breeze beauty was all around him and delight but from that eve he was alone on earth End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Una and the Red Cross Knight From the Fairy Queen Book One, Canto One By Edmund Spencer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six Fancy and Sentiment, Part One Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao Una and the Red Cross Knight A gentle knight was pricking on the plain, he clad in mighty arms and silver shield, wherein all dints of deep wounds did remain, the cruel marks of many a bloody field, yet arms till that time did he never wield. His angry steed did chide his foaming bit, as much disdaining to the curb to yield. Full jolly knight he seemed, and fair did sit, as one for knightly guests in fierce encounters fit. And on his breast a bloody cross he bore, the dear remembrance of his dying lord, for whose sweet sake that glorious badge he wore, and dead as living ever him adored. Upon his shield the like was also scored, for sovereign hope, which in his help he had, right faithful, true he was in deed and word, but of his cheer did seem too solemn sad, yet nothing did he dread, but ever was dread. Upon a great adventure he was bond, 
that greatest gloriana to him gave that greatest glorious queen of fairyland to win him worship and her grace to have which of all earthly things he most did crave and ever as he rode his heart did earn to prove his puissance in battle brave upon his foe and his new force to learn upon his foe a dragon horrible and stern a lovely lady rode him fair beside upon a lowly ass more white than snow yet she much whiter but the same did hide under a veil that wimpled was full low and over all a black stole she did throw as one that inly mourned so was she sad and heavy sate upon her palfrey slow seemed in heart some hidden care she had and by her in a line a milk-white lamb she lad so pure and innocent as that same lamb she was in life and every virtuous law and by descent from royal lineage came of ancient kings and queens that had of yore their sceptres stretched from east to western shore and all the world in their subjection held till that infernal fiend with foul uproar for wasted all their land and then expelled whom to avenge she had this night from far compelled behind her far away a dwarf did lag that lazy seemed in being ever last all wearied with bearing of her bag of needments at his back thus as they passed the day with clouds was sudden overcast and angry jove and hideous storm of rain did pour into his leman's lap so fast that every white to shroud it did constrain and this fairy couple eke to shroud themselves were fain and forced to seek some covert nigh at hand a shady grove not far away they spied that promised eyed the tempest to withstand whose lofty trees ye lad with summer's pride did spread so broad that heaven's light did hide not possible with power of any star and all within were paths and alleys wide with fitting worn and leading inward far fair harbour that them seems so in they entered ah end of home this recording is in the public domain una and the lion by edmund spencer from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter as the narrator and lian yao as una una and the lion from the fairy queen book one canto three one day nigh weary of the irksome way from her unhasty beast she did alight and on the grass her dainty limbs did lay in secret a shadow far from all men's sight from her fair head her fillet she undight and laid her stole aside her angel's face as the great eye of heaven shined bright and made a sunshine in the shady place did never mortal eye behold such heavenly grace it fortunate out of the thickest wood a ramping lion rushed suddenly hunting full greedy after salvage blood soon as the royal virgin he did spy with gaping mouth at her ran greedily to have a taunts devoured her tender course but to the prey when as he drew more nigh his bloody rage assuaged with remorse and with a sight amazed forgot his furious force instead thereof he kissed her weary feet and licked her lily hands with fawning tongue as he her wronged innocence did weet oh how can beauty maister the most strong and simple truth subdue avenging wrong whose yielded pride and proud submission still dreading death when she had marked long her heart gan melt in great compassion and drizzling tears did shed for pure affection the lion lord of every beast in field quoth she his princely puissance doth abate and mighty proud to humble weak does yield 
forgetful of the hungry rage which late him pricked in pity of my sad estate but he my lion and my noble lord how does he find in cruel heart to hate her that him loved and ever most adored as the god of my life why hath he me abhorred redounding tears did choke the end of her plaint which softly echoed from the neighbour wood and sad to see her sorrowful constraint the kingly beast upon her gazing stood with pity calmed down afell his angry mood at last in close heart shutting up her pain arose the virgin born of heavenly brood and to her snowy palfrey got again to seek her strayed champion if she might attain the lion would not leave her desolate but with her went along as the strong guard of her chaste person and a faithful mate of her sad troubles and misfortunes hard still when she slept he kept both watch and ward and when she waked he waited diligent with humble service to her will prepared from her fair eyes he took commandment and ever by her looks conceived her intent end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Bower of Bliss from the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Bower of Bliss from the Fairy Queen, Book 2, Canto 12 There the most dainty paradise on ground itself doth offer to his sober eye in which all pleasures plenteously abound, and none does others happiness envy. The painted flowers, the trees upshooting high, the dales for shade, the hills for breathing space, the trembling groves, the crystal running by, and that which all fair works doth most a grace, the art which all that wrought appeared in no place one would have thought so cunningly the rude and scorned parts were mingled with the fine that nature had for wantonness ensued art and that art at nature did repine so striving each the other to undermine each did the other's work more beautify so differing both in wills agreed in fine so all agreed through sweet diversity this garden to adorn with all variety and in the midst of all a fountain stood of richest substance that on earth might be so pure and shiny that the silver flood through every channel running one might see most goodly it with curious imagery was overwrought and shapes of naked boys of which some seemed with lively jollity to fly about playing their wanton toys whilst others did themselves embay in liquid joys and over all of purest gold was spread a trail of ivy in his native hue for the rich metal was so coloured that white who did not well avised it view would surely deem it to be ivy true lo his lascivious arms adown did creep that themselves dipping in the silver dew their fleecy flowers they fearfully did steep which drops of crystal seemed for wantons to weep infinite streams continually did well out of this fountain sweet and fair to see the which into an ample laver fell and shortly grew to so great quantity that like a little lake it seemed to be whose depth exceeded not three cubits height that through the waves one might the bottom see all paved beneath with jasper shining bright that seemed the fountain in that sea did sail upright eftsoons they heard a most melodious sound 
Of all that mote delight a dainty ear, Such as a taunts might not living on the ground, Save in this paradise, be heard elsewhere. Right hard it was for white which did it hear, To read what manner music that mote be, For all that pleasing is to living ear, Was there consorted in one harmony, Birds, voices, instruments, winds, water, all agree the joyous birds shrouded in cheerful shade their notes unto the voice a tempered sweet the angelical soft trembling voices made to the instruments divine respondents meet the silver sounding instruments did meet with the bass murmur of the waters fall the waters fall with difference discreet now soft now loud unto the wind did call the gentle warbling wind low answered to all. Edmund Spencer End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cave of Sleep From the Fairy Queen, Book One, Canto One By Edmund Spencer From the World's Best Poetry Volume Six Fancy and Sentiment, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. The Cave of Sleep. He, making speedy way through spursed air and through the world of waters wide and deep, to Morpheus' house does hastily repair, amid the bowels of the earth full steep, and lo, where dawning day doth never peep, his dwelling is. There Tethys his wet bed doth ever wash, And Cynthia still doth steep, In silver dew his ever drooping head, While sad night over him her mantle black doth spread. And more to lull him in his slumber soft, A trickling stream from high rock tumbling down, An ever drizzling rain upon the loft, Mixed with a murmuring wind much like the sound, Of swarming bees did cast him in a swound, no other noise nor people's troublous cries as still are wont to annoy the walled town might there be heard but careless quiet lees wrapped in eternal silence far from enemies end of recording this poem is in the public domain The Castle of Indolence by James Thompson from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama as the narrator, and Thomas Peter as the wizard. The Castle of Indolence from Canto One. The castle height of indolence and its false luxury, where for a little time, alas, we lived right jollily. O mortal man who livest here by toil, Do not complain of this thy hard estate, That like an emmet thou must ever moil, Is a sad sentence of an ancient date. And, certes, there is for it reason great, For, though sometimes it makes thee weep and wail, And curse thy star, and early drudge and late, Withouten that would come a heavier bale, loose life unruly passions and diseases pale in lowly dale fast by a river's side with woody hill o'er hill encompassed round a most enchanting wizard did abide than whom a fiend more fell is nowhere found it was i ween a lovely spot of ground and there a season atween june and may half pranked with spring with summer half embrowned, a listless climate made, where sooth to say no living wight could work, ne cared even for play. Was not around but images of rest, sleep soothing groves and quiet lawns between, and flowery beds that slumbrous influence kest, from poppies breathed and beds of pleasant green, where never yet was creeping creature seen. Meantime, unnumbered glittering streamlets played, And hurled everywhere their waters sheen, 
that as they bickered through the sunny glade though restless still themselves a lulling murmur made joined to the prattle of the purling rills were heard the lowing herds along the vale and flocks loud bleeding from the distant hills and vacant shepherds piping in the dale and now and then sweet philomel would wail or stock doves plain amid the forest deep that drowsy rustled to the sighing gale and still a coil the grasshopper did keep yet all these sounds it blent incline it all to sleep full in the passage of the vale above a sable silent solemn forest stood where naught but shadowy forms was seen to move as idless fancied in her dreaming mood and up the hills on either side a wood of blackening pines i waving to and fro sent forth a sleepy horror through the blood and where this valley winded out below the murmuring main was heard and scarcely heard to flow a pleasing land of drowsy head it was of dreams that wave before the half-shut eye and of gay castles in the clouds that pass forever flushing round a summer sky there eke the soft delights that witchingly instill a wanton sweetness through the breast and the calm pleasures always hovered nigh but whate'er smack of noyance or unrest was far far off expelled from this delicious nest the landscape such inspiring perfect ease where indolence for so the wizard height close hid his castle mid embowering trees that half shut out the beams of phoebus bright and made a kind of checkered day and night meanwhile unceasing at the massy gate beneath a spacious palm the wicked wight was placed and to his lute of cruel fate and labor harsh complained lamenting man's estate thither continual pilgrims crowded still from all the roads of earth that pass thereby for as they chanced to breathe on neighboring hill the freshness of this valley smote their eye and drew them ever and anon more nigh till clustering round the enchanter false they hung emolton with his siren melody while o'er the enfeebling lute his hand he flung and to the trembling chords these tempting verses sung behold ye pilgrims of this earth behold see all but man with unearned pleasure gay see her bright robes the butterfly unfold broke from her wintry tomb in prime of may what youthful bride can equal her array who can with her for easy pleasure vie from mead to mead with gentle wing to stray from flower to flower on balmy gales to fly is all she has to do beneath the radiant sky behold the merry minstrels of the morn the swarming songster of the careless grove ten thousand throats that from the flowering thorn him their good god and carol sweet of love such grateful kindly raptures them may move they neither plough nor sow nay fit for flail ere to the barn the nodden sheaves they drove yet there's each harvest dancing in the gale whatever crowns the hill or smiles along the vale outcast of nature man the wretched thrall of bitter dropping sweat of sweltry pain of cares that eat away the heart with gall and of the vices an inhuman train that all proceed from savage thirst of gain for when hard-hearted interest first began to poison earth astraea left the plain guile violence and murder seized on man and for soft milky streams with blood 
the rivers ran come ye who still the cumbrous load of life push hard uphill but as the farthest steep you trust to gain and put an end to strife down thunders back the stone with mighty sweep and hurls your labours to the valley deep forever vain come and without in fee i in oblivion will your sorrows steep your cares your toils will steep you in a sea of full delight oh come ye weary whites to me with me you need not rise at early dawn to pass the joyless day in various towns or oh, louting low on upstart fortune fawn and sell fair honour for some paltry pounds or through the city take your dirty rounds to cheat and dun and lie and visit pay now flattering base now giving secret wounds or prowl in courts of law for human prey in venal senate thieve or rob on broad highway no cocks with me to rustic labour call from village on to village sounding clear to tardy swain no shrill-voiced matron squall no dogs no babes no wives to stun your ear no hammer's thump no horrid blacksmith seer nay noisy tradesmen your sweet slumbers start with sounds that are a misery to hear but all is calm as would delight the heart of sybarite of old all nature and all art here naught but candour reigns indulgent ease good-natured lounging sauntering up and down they who are pleased themselves must always please on others ways they never squint a frown nor heed what haps in hamlet or in town thus from the source of tender indolence with milky blood the heart is overflown is soothed and sweetened by the social sense for interest, envy, pride, and strife are banished hence. What, what is virtue but repose of mind, a pure ethereal calm that knows no storm, above the reach of wild ambition's wind, above those passions that this world deform and torture man? a proud malignant worm but here instead soft gales of passion play and gently stir the heart thereby to form a quicker sense of joy as breezes stray across the enlivened skies and make them still more gay the best of men have ever loved repose they hate to mingle in the filthy fray where the soul sours and gradual rancor grows embittered more from peevish day to day even those whom fame has lent a fairest ray the most renowned of worthy whites of yore from a base world at last have stolen away so scipio to the soft cumean shore retiring tasted joy he never knew before but if a little exercise you choose some zest for ease tis not forbidden here amid the groves you may indulge the muse or tend the blooms and deck the vernal year or softly stealing with your watery gear along the brooks the crimson spotted fry you may delude the whilst amused you hear now the horse stream and now the zephyrs sigh 
attuned to the birds and woodland melody o oh, grievous folly to heap up estate losing the days you see beneath the sun when sudden comes blind unrelenting fate and gives the untasted portion you have won with ruthless toil and many a wretch undone to those who mock you gone to pluto's reign there with sad ghosts to pine and shadows done but sure it is of vanities most vain to toil for what you here untoiling may obtain he ceased but still their trembling ears retained the deep vibrations of his witching song that by a kind of magic power constrained to enter in pell-mell the listening throng heaps poured on heaps and yet they slipped along in silent ease as when beneath the beam of summer moons the distant woods among or by some flood all silvered with the gleam the soft embodied fays through airy portal stream by the smooth demon so it ordered was and here his baneful bounty first began though some there were who would not further pass and his alluring baits suspected han the wise distrust the too fair spoken man yet through the gate they cast a wistful eye not to move on perdi is all they can for do their very best they cannot fly but often each way look and often sorely sigh the rooms with costly tapestry were hung where was inwoven many a gentle tale such as of old the rural poets sung or of arcadian or sicilian vale reclining lovers in the lonely dale poured forth at large the sweetly tortured heart or sighing tender passion swelled the gale and taught charmed echo to resound their smart while flocks woods streams around repose and peace impart each sound too here to languishment inclined lulled the weak bosom and induced ease aerial music in the warbling wind at distance rising oft by small degrees nearer and nearer came till o'er the trees it hung and breathed such soul dissolving airs as did alas with soft perdition please entangled deep in its enchanting snares the listening heart forgot all duties and all cares a certain music never known before here lulled the pensive melancholy mind full easily obtained behooves no more but sidelong to the gently waving wind to lay the well-tuned instrument reclined from which with airy flying fingers light beyond each mortal touch the most refined the god of winds drew sounds of deep delight whence with just cause the harp of aeolus it height ah me what hand can touch the string so fine who up the lofty diapson roll such sweet such sad such solemn airs divine then let them down again into the soul now rising love they fanned now pleasing dole they breathed in tender musings through the heart and now a graver sacred strain they stole as when seraphic hands a hymn impart wild warbling nature all above the reach of art end of poem this recording is in the public domain outward bound by thomas bailey aldrich from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by sonia outward bound i leave behind me the elm shadowed square and carven portals of the silent street and wander on with listless vagrant feet through seaward leading alleys till the air smells of the sea and straightway then the care slips from my heart and life once more is sweet at the lane's ending lie the white-winged fleet o oh, restless fancy 
whither wouldst thou fare here are brave pinions that shall take thee far gaunt hulks of norway ships of red ceylon slim-masted lovers of the blue azores tis but an instant hence to zanzibar or to the regions of the midnight sun ionian isles are thine and all the fairy shores end of poem this recording is in the public domain the lady of shalott by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for LibriVox.org by lian yao as the narrator craig franklin as the reaper sonia as the lady of shalott and thomas peter as sir lancelot the lady of shalott part one on either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky and through the field the roads run by to many towered camelot and up and down the people go gazing where the lilies blow round an island there below the island of shalott willows whiten aspens quiver little breezes dusk and shiver through the wave that runs for ever by the island in the river flowing down to camelot four grey walls and four grey towers overlook a space of flowers and the silent isle embowers the lady of shalott by the margin willow veiled slide the heavy barges trailed by slow horses and unhailed the shallop flitteth silken sailed skimming down to camelot but who hath seen her wave her hand or at the casement seen her stand or is she known in all the land the lady of shalott only reapers reaping early in among the bearded barley hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered camelot and by the moon the reaper weary piling sheaves in uplands airy listening whispers tis the fairy lady of shalott part two there she weaves by night and day a magic web with colours gay she has heard a whisper say a curse is on her if she stay to look down to camelot she knows not what the curse may be and so she weaveth steadily and little other care hath she the lady of shalott and moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year shadows of the world appear there she sees the highway near winding down to camelot there the river eddy whirls and there the surly village chowls and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from shalott sometimes a troop of damsels glad an abbot on an ambling pad sometimes a curly shepherd lad or long-haired page in crimson clad goes by to towered camelot and sometimes through the mirror blue the knights come riding two and two she hath no loyal knight and true the lady of shalott but in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to camelot or when the moon was overhead came two young lovers lately wed i am half sick of shadows said the lady of shalott part three a bowshot from her bower eaves he rode between the barley sheaves the sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold sir launcelot a red cross knight for ever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote shalott the gemmy bridle glittered free like to some branch of stars we see hung in the golden galaxy 
the bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot. And from his blazoned baldric slung, a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armour rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jewelled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together, as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still Shalott. His broad clear brow in sunlight glowed. On burnished hooves his war-horse trode, From underneath his helmet flowed His coal-black curls as on he rode, As he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river He flashed into the crystal mirror. Tira lira. By the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, She made three paces through the room, she saw the water lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume. She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side. The curse is come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Part four. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in the banks complaining. Heavily the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat, Beneath a willow left afloat, And round about the prow she wrote, The Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, Like some bold seer in a trance, Seeing all his own mischance, With a glassy countenance, Did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day, she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white, that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light through the noises of the night. She floated down to Camelot. And as the boat head wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song. The Lady of Shalott heard Carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot, for ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the waterside, singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, a course between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here, and in the royal palace near, died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, She has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace. The Lady of Shalott. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Jason in Panama as the wedding guest and the pilot's boy Craig Franklin as the Ancient Mariner Thomas Peter as the crew, second voice, and the hermit And Lian Yao as life and death First Voice and the Pilot Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner Part 1 An ancient mariner meeteth three gallants bidden to a wedding feast, and detaineth one. 
the wedding guest is spellbound by the eye of the old seafaring man and constrained to hear his tale the mariner tells how the ship sailed southward with a good wind and fair weather till it reached the line the wedding guest heareth the bridal music but the mariner continueth his tale the ship drawn by a storm toward the south pole the land of ice and of fearful sounds where no living thing was to be seen till a great sea-bird called the albatross came through the snow fog and was received with great joy and hospitality and lo the albatross proveth a bird of good omen and followeth the ship as it returned northward through fog and ice the ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen it is an ancient mariner and he stoppeth one of three by thy long gray beard and glittering eye now wherefore stopst thou me the bridegroom's doors are opened wide and i am next of kin the guests are met the feast is set mayst hear the merry din he holds him with his skinny hand there was a ship quoth he hold off unhand me greybeard loon eftsoons his hand dropped he he holds him with his glittering eye the wedding guest stood still he listens like a three years child the mariner hath his will the wedding guest sat on a stone he cannot choose but hear and thus spake on that ancient man the bright-eyed mariner the ship was cheered the harbour cleared merrily did we drop below the kirk below the hill below the lighthouse top the sun came up upon the left out of the sea came he and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea higher and higher every day till over the mast at noon the wedding guest here beat his breast for he heard the loud bassoon the bride hath paced into the hall red as a rose is she nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy the wedding guest he beat his breast yet he cannot choose but hear and thus spake on that ancient man the bright-eyed mariner and now the storm blast came and he was tyrannous and strong he struck with his oar taking wings and chased us south along with sloping masts and dipping prow as who pursued with yell and blow still treads the shadow of his foe and forward bends his head the ship drove fast loud roared the blast and southward i we fled and now there came both mist and snow and it grew wondrous cold and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald and through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken that ice was all between the ice was here the ice was there the ice was all around it crept and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound at length did cross an albatross through the fog it came as if it had been a christian soul we hailed it in god's name it ate the food it near had eat and round and round it flew the ice did split with a thunder fit the helmsman steered us through and a good south wind sprung up behind the albatross did follow and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow in mist or cloud on mast or shroud it perched for vespers nine whilst all the night through fog smoked white glimmered the white moonshine god save thee ancient mariner from the fiends that plague thee thus why look'st thou so with my crossbow i shot the albatross part two his shipmates cry out against the ancient mariner for killing the bird of good luck but when the fog cleared off they justify the same and thus make themselves accomplices in the crime the fair breeze continues the ship enters the pacific ocean and sails northward even till it reaches the line the ship hath been suddenly becalmed 
and the albatross begins to be avenged a spirit had followed them one of the invisible inhabitants of this planet neither departed souls nor angels concerning whom the learned jew josephus and the platonic constantinopolitan michael sallus may be consulted they are very numerous and there is no climate or element without one or more the shipmates in their sore distress would fain throw the whole guild on the ancient mariner in sign whereof they hang the dead seabird round his neck the sun now rose upon the right out of the sea came he still hid in mist and on the left went down into the sea and the good south wind still blew behind but no sweet bird did follow nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow and i had done an hellish thing and it would work and woe well for all of it i had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow ah wretch said they the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow nor dim nor red like god's own head the glorious sun uprist then all averred i had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist twas right said they such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist the fair breeze blew the white foam flew the furrow followed free we were the first that ever burst into that silent sea down dropped the breeze the sails dropped down twas sad as sad could be as we did speak only to break the silence of the sea all in a hot and copper sky the bloody sun at noon right up above the mast did stand no bigger than the moon day after day day after day we stuck nor breath nor motion as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean water water everywhere and all the boards did shrink water water everywhere nor any drop to drink the very deep did rot oh christ that ever this should be yea slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea about about in reel and rout the death fires danced at night the water like a witch's oils burnt green and blue and white and some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so nine fathoms deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow and every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root we could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot ah well a day what evil looks had i from old and young instead of the cross the albatross about my neck was hung part three the ancient mariner behold us a sign in the element afar off at its nearer approach it seemeth him to be a ship and at a dear ransom he freeth his speech from the bonds of thirst a flash of joy and horror follows for can it be a ship that comes onward without wind or tide it seemeth him but the skeleton of a ship and its ribs are seen as bars on the face of the setting sun the spectre woman and her death mate and no other on board the skeleton ship like vessel like crew death and life in death have diced for the ship's crew and she the latter winneth the ancient mariner no twilight within the courts of the sun at the rising of the moon one after another his shipmates drop down dead but life in death begins her work on the ancient mariner there passed a weary time each throat was parched and glazed each eye a weary time a weary time how glazed each weary eye when looking westward i beheld a something in the sky at first it seemed a little speck and then it seemed a mist it moved and moved and took at last a certain shape i wist a speck a mist a shape i wist and still it neared and neared as if it dodged a water sprite it plunged and tacked and veered with throat sun slaked with black lips baked we could nor laugh nor wail through utter drought all dumb we stood i bit my arm i sucked the blood and cried a sail a sail with throat sun slaked with black lips baked agape they heard me call 
gramercy they for joy did grin and all at once their breath drew in as they were drinking all see see i cried she tacks no more hither to work as wheel without a breeze without a tide she steadies with upright keel the western wave was all aflame the day was well nigh done almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun when the strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun and straight the sun was flecked with bars heaven's mother send us grace as if through a dungeon grate he peered with broad and burning face alas thought i and my heart beat loud how fast she nears and nears and those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers and those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a grate and is that woman all her crew is that a death and are there two is death that woman's mate her lips were red her looks were free her locks were yellow as gold her skin was as white as leprosy the nightmare life in death was she who thicks a man's blood with cold the naked hulk alongside came and the twain were casting dice the game is done i've won i've won quoth she and whistles thrice the sun's rim dips the stars rush out at one stride comes the dark with far heard whispers o'er the sea off shot the spectre bark we listened and looked sideways up fear at my heart as at a cup my life-blood seemed to sip the stars were dim and thick the night the steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white from the sails the dew did drip till clomb above the eastern bar the horned moon with one bright star within the nether tip one after one by the star dogged moon too quick for groan or sigh each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye four times fifty living men and i heard nor sign nor groan with heavy thump a lifeless lump they dropped down one by one the souls did from their bodies fly they fled to bliss or woe and every soul it passed me by like the whiz of my crossbow part four the wedding guest feareth that a spirit is talking to him but the ancient mariner assureth him of his bodily life and proceedeth to relate his horrible penance he despiseth the creatures of the calm and envieth that they should live and so many lie dead but the curse liveth for him in the eye of the dead man in his loneliness and fixedness he yearneth towards the journeying moon and the stars that still sojourn yet still move onward and everywhere the blue sky belongs to them and is their appointed rest and their native country and their own natural homes which they enter unannounced as lords that are certainly expected and yet there is a silent joy at their arrival by the light of the moon he beholdeth god's creatures of the great calm their beauty and their happiness he blesseth them in his heart the spell begins to break i fear thee ancient mariner i fear thy skinny hand and thou art long and lank and brown as is the ribbed sea sand i fear thee and thy glittering eye and thy skinny hand so brown fear not fear not thou wedding guest this body drop not down alone alone all all alone alone on a wide wide sea and never a saint took pity on my soul in agony the many men so beautiful and they all dead did lie and a thousand thousand slimy things lived on and so did i i looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away i looked upon the rotting deck and there the dead men lay i looked to heaven and tried to pray but or ever a prayer had gushed a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust i closed my lids and kept them close and the balls like pulses beat for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye and the dead were at my feet
the cold sweat melted from their limbs nor rot nor reek did they the look with which they looked on me had never passed away an orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high but oh more horrible than that is a curse in a dead man's eye seven days seven nights i saw that curse and yet i could not die the moving moon went up the sky in his loneliness and nowhere did abide softly she was going up and a star or two beside her beams bemocked the sultry main like april hoar-frost spread but where the ship's huge shadow lay the charmed water burnt away a still and awful red beyond the shadow of the ship i watched the water snakes they moved in tracks of shining white and when they reared the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes within the shadow of the ship i watched their rich attire blue glossy green and velvet black they coiled and swam and every track was a flash of golden fire o oh, happy living things no tongue their beauty might declare a spring of love gushed from my heart and i blessed them unaware sure my kind saint took pity on me and i blessed them unaware the self same moment i could pray and from my neck so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea part five by grace of the holy mother the ancient mariner is refreshed with rain he heareth sounds and seeth strange sights and commotions in the sky and the element the bodies of the ship's crew are inspired and the ship moves on but not by the souls of the men nor by demons of earth or middle air but by a blessed troop of angelic spirits sent down by the invocation of the guardian saint the lonesome spirit from the south pole carries on the ship as far as the line in obedience to the angelic troop but still requireth vengeance the polar spirit's fellow demons the invisible inhabitants of the element take part in his wrong and two of them relate one to the other that penance long and heavy for the ancient mariner hath been accorded to the polar spirit who returneth southward o oh, sleep it is a gentle thing beloved from pole to pole to mary queen the praise be given she sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul the silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained i dreamt that they were filled with dew and when i awoke it rained my lips were wet my throat was cold my garments all were dank sure i had drunken in my dreams and still my body drank i moved and could not feel my limbs i was so light almost i thought that i had died in sleep and was a blessed ghost and soon i heard a roaring wind it did not come anear but with its sound it shook the sails that were so thin and sear the upper air burst into life and a hundred fire flags sheen to and fro they were hurried about and to and fro and in and out the wan stars danced between and the coming wind did roar more loud and the sails did sigh like sedge and the rain poured down from one black cloud the moon was at its edge the thick black cloud was cleft and still the moon was at its side like water shot from some high crag the lightning fell with never a jag a river steep and wide the loud wind never reached the ship yet now the ship moved on beneath the lightning and the moon the dead men gave a groan they groaned they stirred they all uprose nor spake nor moved their eyes it had been strange even in a dream to have seen those dead men rise the helmsman steered the ship moved on yet never a breeze up blew the mariners all gan work the ropes where they were wont to do they raised their limbs like lifeless tools we were a ghastly crew the body of my brother's son stood by me knee to knee the body and i pulled at one rope but he said naught to me i fear thee ancient mariner be calm thou wedding guest twas not those souls that fled in pain 
which to their courses came again but a troop of spirits blessed for when it dawned they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed around around flew each sweet sound then darted to the sun slowly the sounds came back again now mixed now one by one sometimes a dropping from the sky i heard the skylark sing sometimes all little birds that are how they seem to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning and now twas like all instruments now like a lonely flute and now it is an angel song that makes the heavens be mute it ceased yet still the sails made on a pleasant noise till noon a noise like of a hidden brook in the leafy month of june that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune till noon we quietly sailed on yet never a breeze did breathe slowly and smoothly went the ship moved onwards from beneath under the keel nine fathoms deep from the land of mist and snow the spirit slid and it was he that made the ship to go the sails at noon left off their tune and the ship stood still also the sun right up above the mast had fixed her to the ocean but in a minute she gan stir with a short uneasy motion backwards and forwards half her length with a short uneasy motion then like a pouring horse let go she made a sudden bound it flung the blood into my head and i fell down in a swound how long in that same fit i lay i have not to declare but ere my living life returned i heard and in my soul discerned two voices in the air is it he quoth one is this the man by him who died on cross with his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross the spirit who bideth by himself in the land of mist and snow he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow the other was a softer voice as soft as honey dew quoth he the man hath penance done and penance more will do part six the mariner hath been cast into a trance for the angelic power causeth the vessel to drive northward faster than human life could endure the supernatural motion is retarded the mariner awakes and his penance begins anew the curse is finally expiated and the ancient mariner beholdeth his native country the angelic spirits leave their bodies and appear in their own forms of light but tell me tell me speak again thy soft response renewing what makes that ship drive on so fast what is the ocean doing still as a slave before his lord the ocean hath no blast his great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast if he may know which way to go for she guides him smooth or grim see brother see how graciously she looketh down on him but why drives on that ship so fast without all wave or wind the air is cut away before and closes from behind fly brother fly more high more high or we shall be belated for slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated i woke we were sailing on as in a gentle weather twas night calm night the moon was high the dead men stood together all stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon fitter all fixed on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter the pang the curse with which they died had never passed away i could not draw my eyes from theirs nor turn them up to pray and now this spell was snapped once more i viewed the ocean green and looked far forth yet little saw of what had else been seen like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head 
because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread but soon there breathed the wind on me nor sound nor motion made its path was not upon the sea in ripple or in shade it raised my hair it fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring it mingled strangely with my fears yet it felt like a welcoming swiftly swiftly flew the ship yet she sailed softly too sweetly sweetly blew the breeze on me alone it blew oh dream of joy is this indeed the lighthouse top i see is this the hill is this the kirk is this mine own country we drifted o'er the harbour bar and i with sobs did pray oh let me be awake my god or let me sleep alway the harbour bay was clear as glass so smoothly it was strewn and on the bay the moonlight lay and the shadow of the moon the rock shone bright the kirk no less that stands above the rock the moonlight steeped in silentness the steady weathercock and the bay was white with silent light till rising from the same full many shapes that shadows were in crimson colours came a little distance from the prow those crimson shadows were i turned my eyes upon the deck oh christ what saw i there each course lay flat lifeless and flat and by the holy rood a man all light a seraph man on every course there stood this seraph band each waved his hand it was a heavenly sight they stood as signals to the land each one a lovely light this seraph band each waved his hand no voice did they impart no voice but oh the silence sank like music on my heart but soon i heard the dash of oars i heard the pilot's cheer my head was turned poor force away and i saw a boat appear the pilot and the pilot's boy i heard them coming fast dear lord in heaven it was a joy that dead men could not blast i saw a third i heard his voice it is the hermit good he singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood he'll shrieve my soul he'll wash away the albatross's blood part seven the hermit of the wood approaches the ship with wonder the ship suddenly sinketh the ancient mariner is saved in the pilot's boat the ancient mariner earnestly entreateth the hermit to shrive him and the penance of life falls on him and ever and anon throughout his future life an agony constraineth him to travel from land to land and to teach by his own example love and reverence to all things that god made and loveth this hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea how loudly his sweet voice he rears he loves to talk with marineers that come from a far country he kneels at morn and noon and eve he hath the cushion plump it is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump the skiff boat neared i heard them talk why this is strange i trow where are those lights so many and fair that sable made but now strange by my faith the hermit said and they answered not our cheer the planks looked warped and see those sails how thin they are and sear i never saw aught like to them unless perchance it were brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along when the ivy tod is heavy with snow and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young dear lord it hath a fiendish look the pilot made reply i am afeard push on push on said the hermit cheerily the boat came closer to the ship but i nor spake nor stirred the boat came closer beneath the ship and straight a sound was heard under the water it rumbled on till louder and more dread it reached the ship it split the bay the ship went down like lead stunned by that loud and dreadful sound which sky and ocean smote like one that hath been seven days drowned my body lay afloat 
but swift as dreams myself i found within the pilot's boat upon the whirl where sank the ship the boat span round and round and all was still save that the hill was telling of the sound i moved my lips the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit the holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit i took the oars the pilot's boy who now doth crazy go laughed loud and long and all the while his eyes went to and fro ha ha quoth he full plain i see the devil knows how to row and now all in my own country i stood on the firm land the hermit stepped forth from the boat and scarcely he could stand oh shrieve me shrieve me holy man the hermit crossed his brow say quick quoth he i bid thee say what manner of man art thou forthwith this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony which forced me to begin my tale and then it left me free since then at an uncertain hour that agony returns until my ghastly tale is told this heart within me burns i pass like night from land to land i have strange power of speech the moment that his face i see i know the man that must hear me to him my tale i teach what loud uproar burst from that door the wedding guests are there but in the garden bower the bride and bridemaids singing are and hark the little vesper bell which biddeth me to prayer o oh, wedding guest this soul hath been alone on a wide wide sea so lonely twas that god himself scarce seemed there to be o oh, sweeter than the marriage feast tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company to walk together to the kirk and all together pray while each to his great father bends old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay farewell farewell but this i tell to thee thou wedding guest he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast he prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small for the dear god who loveth us he made and loveth all the mariner whose eye is bright whose beard with age is hoar is gone and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door he went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn a sadder and a wiser man he rose the morrow morn End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ula Loom by Edgar Allan Poe From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator And Sonia as Psyche Ula Loom The skies they were ashen and sober the leaves they were crisped and sear the leaves they were withering and sear it was night in the lonesome october of my most immemorial year it was hard by the dim lake of arbor in the misty mid-region of weir it was down by the clank tarn of arbor in the ghoul-haunted woodland of weir here once through an alley titanic of cypress i roamed with my soul of cypress with psyche my soul these were days when my heart was volcanic as the scoriac rivers that roll as the lavas that restlessly roll their sulphurous currents down yannick in the ultimate climes of the pole that groan as they roll down mount yannick in the realms of the boreal pole our talk had been serious and sober but our thoughts they were palsied and sear our memories were treacherous and sear for we knew not the month was october and we marked not the night of the year ah night of all nights in the year we noted not the dim lake of arbor 
though once we had journeyed down here, remembered not the dank tarn of Auber, nor the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. And now, as the night was senescent, and star-dials pointed to morn, as the star-dials hinted of morn, at the end of our path a liquescent and nebulous luster was born, out of which a miraculous crescent arose with a duplicate horn, Astarte's bediamonded crescent, distinct with its duplicate horn. And I said, She is warmer than Dian. She rolls through an ether of sighs. She revels in a region of sighs. She has seen that the tears are not dry on these cheeks, where the worm never dies. And has come past the stars of the lion. To point us the path to the skies, to the Lethean peace of the skies. Come up, in despite of the lion, to shine on us with her bright eyes. Come up through the lair of the lion, with love in her luminous eyes. But Psyche, uplifting her finger, said, Sadly this star I mistrust, her pallor I strangely mistrust. O oh, hasten! Oh, let us not linger. Oh, fly, let us fly, for we must. In terror she spoke, letting sink her wings until they trailed in the dust. In agony sobbed, letting sink her plumes till they trailed in the dust, till they sorrowfully trailed in the dust. I replied, This is nothing but dreaming. Let us on by this tremulous light. Let us bathe in this crystalline light. Its sibyllic splendor is beaming with hope and in beauty tonight. See, it flickers up the sky through the night. Ah, we safely may trust to its gleaming and be sure it will lead us aright. We safely may trust to a gleaming that cannot but guide us aright, since it flickers up to heaven through the night. Thus I pacified Psyche, and kissed her, and tempted her out of her gloom, and conquered her scruples and gloom, and we passed to the end of the vista, but were stopped by the door of a tomb, by the door of a legended tomb, and I said, What is written, sweet sister, on the door of this legended tomb? She replied, Ulalum, Ulalum, tis the vault of thy lost Ulalum. Then my heart it grew ashen and sober, as the leaves that were crisped and sere, as the leaves that were withering and sere, and I cried, It was surely October, on this very night of last year, that I journeyed, I journeyed down here that I brought a dread burden down here, on this night of all nights in the year. Ah, what demon has tempted me here? Well, I know now this dim lake of Auber, this misty mid-region of Weir. Well, I know now this dank tarn of Auber, this ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator and Sonia as the Raven. The Raven Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of some one gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, 
and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor eagerly i wished the morrow vainly i had sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow sorrow for the lost lenore for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named lenore nameless here for evermore and the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before so that now to still the beating of my heart i stood repeating tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door that is it and nothing more presently my soul grew stronger hesitating then no longer sir said i or madam truly your forgiveness i implore but the fact is i was napping and so gently you came rapping and so faintly you came tapping tapping at my chamber door that i scarce was sure i heard you here i open wide the door darkness there and nothing more deep into that darkness peering long i stood there wondering fearing doubting dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before but the silence was unbroken and the darkness gave no token and the only word there spoken was the whispered word lenore this i whispered and an echo murmured back the word lenore merely this and nothing more back into the chamber turning all my soul within me burning soon again i heard a tapping something louder than before surely said i surely there is something at my window lattice let me see then what thereat is and this mystery explore let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore tis the wind and nothing more open then i flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore not the least obeisance made he not an instant stopped or stayed he but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door perched upon a bust of pallas just above my chamber door perched and sat and nothing more then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou i said art sure no craven ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore quoth the raven nevermore much i marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly though its answer little meaning little relevancy bore for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore but the raven sitting lonely on the placid bust spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour nothing further then he uttered not a feather then he fluttered till i scarcely more than muttered other friends have flown before on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before then the bird said nevermore startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken doubtless said i what it utters is its only stock and store caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his song one burden bore till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of nevermore nevermore but the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling straight i wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door then upon the velvet sinking i betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy thinking what this ominous bird of yore what this grim ungainly ghastly gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore thus i sat engaged in guessing but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core this and more i sat divining with my head at ease reclining 
on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press ah never more then methought the air grew denser perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch i cried thy god hath lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee respite respite and nepenthe from the memories of lenore quaff o oh, quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost lenore quoth the raven never more prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted on this home by horror haunted tell me truly i implore is there is there balm in gilead tell me tell me i implore quoth the raven never more prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil by that heaven that bends above us by that god we both adore tell this soul with sorrow laden if within the distant aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named lenore clasp a fair and radiant maiden whom the angels named lenore quoth the raven nevermore be that word our sign of parting bird or fiend i shrieked upstarting get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken leave my loneliness unbroken quit the bust above my door take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door quoth the raven <laughs> never more and the raven never flitting still is sitting still is sitting on the pallid bust of pallas just above my chamber door and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore end of poem this recording is in the public domain Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Kubla Khan In the summer of the year 1797, the author, then in ill health, had retired to a lonely farmhouse between Porlock and Linton, on the Exmoor confines of Somerset and Devonshire. In consequence of a slight indisposition, an anodyne had been prescribed, from the effect of which he fell asleep in his chair at the moment he was reading the following sentence, or words of the same substance, in Purchase's pilgrimage. Here the Khan Kubla commanded a palace to be built, and a stately garden thereunto, and thus ten miles of fertile ground were enclosed with a wall. The author continued for about three hours in a profound sleep, at least of the external senses, during which time he has the most vivid confidence that he could not have composed less than from two to three hundred lines, if that indeed can be called composition, in which all the images rose up before him as things, with a parallel production of the correspondent expressions, without any sensation or consciousness of effort. On awaking he appeared to himself to have a distinct recollection of the whole, and, taking his pen, ink, and paper, instantly and eagerly wrote down the lines that are here preserved. At this moment he was unfortunately called out by a person on business from Porlock, and detained by him above an hour, and on his return to his room found, to his no small surprise and mortification, that though he still retained some vague and dim recollection of the general purport of the vision, yet, with the exception of some eight or ten scattered lines and images, all the rest had passed away, like the images on the surface of a stream into which a stone had been cast. But, alas, 
without the after-restoration of the latter. The Author, 1816 In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure-dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran, through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens, bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm, which slanted down the green hill athwart a seed and cover, a savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath the waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, amid whose swift, half-intermitted burst, huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles, meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale, the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult Kubla heard from far Ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid. And on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Tabora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song? To such a deep delight twould win me that, with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. And all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, Beware! Beware his flashing eyes! his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Haunted Palace by Edgar Allan Poe from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox .org by sonia the haunted palace in the greenest of our valleys by good angels tenanted once a fair and stately palace radiant palace reared its head in the monarch thought's dominion it stood there never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair banners yellow glorious golden on its roof did float and flow this all this was in the olden time long ago and every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day along the ramparts plumed and pallid a winged odour went away wanderers in that happy valley through two luminous windows saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law round about the throne were sitting poor Furogen, in state his glory well befitting the ruler of the realm was seen and all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door through which came flowing 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 and sparkling evermore a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king but evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate ah let us mourn 
for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate and round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed and travellers now within that valley through the red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh but smile no more end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sunken city by wilhelm muller translated from german by james clarence mangan from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox .org by sonia the sunken city hark the faint bells of the sunken city peal once more their wonted evening chime from the deep abysses floats a ditty wild and wondrous of the olden time temples towers and domes of many stories there lie buried in an ocean grave undescried save when their golden glories gleam at sunset through the lighted wave and the mariner who had seen them glisten in whose ears those magic bells do sound night by night bides there to watch and listen though death lurks behind each dark rock round so the bells of memory's wonder city peal for me their old melodious chime so my heart pours forth a changeful ditty sad and pleasant from the bygone time domes and towers and castles fancy builded there lie lost to daylight's garish beams there lie hidden till unveiled and gilded glory gilded by my nightly dreams and then hear i music sweet upknelling from many a well-known phantom band and through tears can see my natural dwelling far off in the spirit's luminous land end of poem this recording is in the public domain the walker of the snow by charles dawson shanley from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox .org by craig franklin the walker of the snow speed on speed on good master the camp lies far away we must cross the haunted valley before the close of day how the snow blight came upon me i will tell you as i go the blight of the shadow hunter who walks the midnight snow to the cold december heaven came the pale moon and the stars as the yellow sun was sinking behind the purple bars the snow was deeply drifted upon the ridges drear that lay for miles around me and the camps for which we steer twas silent on the hillside and by the solemn wood no sound of life or motion to break the solitude save the wailing of the moose bird with a plaintive note and low and the skating of the red leaf upon the frozen snow and said i though dark is falling and far the camp must be yet my heart it would be lightsome if i had but company and then i sang and shouted keeping measure as i sped to the harp twang of the snowshoe as it sprang beneath my tread nor far into the valley had i dipped upon my way when a dusky figure joined me in a capuchon of grey bending upon the snowshoes with a long and limber stride and i hailed the dusky stranger as we travelled side by side but no token of communion gave he by word or look and the fear chill fell upon me at the crossing of the brook 
for i saw by the sickly moonlight as i followed bending low that the walking of the stranger left no footmarks on the snow then the fear chill gathered o'er me like a shroud around me cast as i sank upon the snowdrift where the shadow hunter passed and the other trappers found me before the break of day with my dark hair blanched and whitened as the snow in which i lay but they spoke not as they raised me for they knew that in the night i had seen the shadow hunter and had withered in his blight sancta maria speed us the sun is falling low before us lies the valley of the walker of the snow end of poem this recording is in the public domain